Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea Podcast Record Club. It's always weird for me to have to do that introduction because I don't often have to do it. Usually, Jake's with us. Jake's not with us today. Today, it's just me and August, and we're here Indeed. to discuss a record that August has put forward as his recommended record club uh, because it is celebrating or has recently celebrated a momentous anniversary. Of course, we're talking about a post-hardcore classic from the legendary they're like the kind of uh deaf tones of metalcore in a weird sense because they like bring this sort of dreamy very atmospheric and kind of beautiful yes. sound to what is otherwise a very kind of gnarly genre of music very yeah gnarly abrasive all all the all the fun buzzwords you want to throw at a and so it's like i guess because hopes fall have well, they kind of, they didn't, haven't put out many records. They were broken up for I, a good amount of for, time, I think. They've been, I think, broken up for longer than they've been together. <laughs> I believe they're technically currently still active. They put out a single in 2020. So yes, um, yes. They're, they're, still, they're still around. They are originally from North Carolina. And North they, Carolina. They very much sort of established themselves in that period in the late 90s and early 2000s where kind of emo and emo's relationship with hardcore was kind of at its most sort of culturally dense. And and, had- and notably, they established themselves in a way that was very uh, unique among their contemporaries as a Christian hardcore group. Uh Something that they half move away from, half don't on this album, which I think really adds to its mystique. And it's it's worth kind of explaining what happened here and how this record ended up existing in the form it does, because mm-hmm. it this group started in 1988 with their uh, EP, The Frailty of Words. So this EP was basically made with a pretty different crew from the this album like all that was retained from satellite from the ep to satellite years was guitarist joshua brigham and drummer adam morgan and the rest of the lineup the vocalist the their uh backing guitarist and backing vocalist it, like even the fucking bassist changed like there was this whole paradigm shift in the band when they went to the label but and they signed a three label de- a three record deal with trust kill records which resulted in like this huge shuffling of the band's members as i've said and notably the departure of their original vocalist ryan Parrish, who had already written a majority of this record's lyrics I think all of them, I'm not entirely sure, but his fingerprint, and he was kind of the driving force behind his band's Christian Edge. So that's just this weird kind of fingerprint, this weird ghost that looms over this album that is never quite spoken out loud. And also on here, we've got some collaboration from matt talbot of hum mm-hmm. he, uh, he produced this record in produced fact. it okay and he sings yes. the song escape pod for tangibles intangibles so yeah it's really interesting actually the collaboration with matt talbot it kind of feels like it tells you a lot about this album and and, and the way that it sounds to a certain extent i mean i don't want to read into it too much but like hum were known as being like one of those 90s alt rock slash sort of leaning more uh, slightly into the hardcore side of things but much more in the alt rock lane but they brought a very sort of dreamy sound yeah that dream kind of deaf tones once they were doing on records like you'd prefer an astronaut for instance so like yeah you can see how that collaboration kind of evolved out of a desire or I, I guess a convergence of what uh, artists like Matt Talbot were doing. I think that Hum had broken up by this point. And then, of course, the direction that this band were heading in with this lineup change as well. And with this interesting new, much more, I, I guess I would say, expansive sound that they found here. It's it's Yeah. It was- and they definitely had their roots in like melodic hardcore, but there's a very marked difference between the music and the production presented here 
than just like your run of the mill melodic metal core album. Mm. It's like it's got its toes dipped in so many different things, and it kind of the the genre fusions, I suppose, not only just metalcore and post hardcore, also, but the very strong influence of screamo within those vocals as well. Screamo, even, yeah, even yeah. a bit of Midwest emo, and even a bit of space rock as well. You have these different kind of confluences, and I guess it speaks to why yeah, it's very jams and T core, and why we would be doing a record club on it because we tend to love these kinds of bands that kind of pick and combine elements of different sort of spheres of metal or of rock music or even of just of genres more broadly than that and kind of bring them together to create this very unique hybrid sound and I think that the Satellite Years is a really like fascinating and fantastic execution of that hybrid sound like it is somewhere between like you know somewhere midway between Thursday and Deftones or like it's just some middle ground that it strikes between these two poles that Uh, represent things we already love the group that always strikes me as definitely not an influence because these two bands were coming out at the same time but they remind me a lot of like how coheed and cambria produce their particular instrumental flavors this really this really like peppy guitar with the with really bold dashing riffs kind of complemented by this really atmospheric production it it really reminds me of this this particular style sound and scene but yeah with with that huge desire to just mash everything together and just see what comes out and that's that's just like and that's where this I think really like, exciting. the hardcore side of things really careens nicely into the like emo by way of space rock kind of thing. Because you have a lot of like really sort of like powerful sort of playing on here and sort of really kind of anthemic sort of power chord chugging sort of real ascendant sort of compositions here that really kind of make you feel as though, you know, you're emotionally surging in a certain way it, it, it's not as dour as a lot of the bands that we might reference you know a lot of the other kind of more aggressive hardcore bands like thursday for instance that i just mm. mentioned it's not quite as kind of lingering in the oh yeah harshness thursday and brutality yeah, thursday's that. like that's a i think great example of like thursday's just like fucking lead vocalist drops a quarter and then we got a song about the endless despair he fell into and this band is is just writing like the just doing this like fucking beautiful transcendent shit it's even like a little bit post-rock in the song like andromeda as well like the opening oh yeah this record which is completely instrumental incidentally it's one of two instrumentals mm-hmm. on here and it's just like it's Red so focused on the other yeah, yeah absolutely it's so but focused. I think we can get into these in tandem even yeah yeah absolutely these instrumental moments are so like they're so just full of like power and just like beauty as well there are bands that are really not afraid to linger in those beautiful moments and there are like I think clean sections of certain songs that are otherwise really, really heavy, like Dana Walker does this really great kind of uh, switch between these really kind of some of the heaviest parts of the entire record and these kind of really beautiful sort of resonant uh, moments as well. The final stretch of Dead in Magazines, which is another favorite. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dead in Magazines, like the whole like, like, I guess without even getting into it, like the bending is is like the key song for just like, we're going to do all the sounds. Oh, uh, God. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, the like the instrumentals here, uh, like and pure instrumental songs that being uh, all do this really fantastic job of of feeling so essential to how the album progresses, like mm. like Redshift's is a song I can see a lot of people writing off as something that's like this filler interstitial moment. But, but what makes hopes fall interesting to me, at least is that those are like what should be an interstitial moment does have this clear level of effort and time sunk into it to the point where it just ceases to be that and becomes part of the record's flow, its pace, its composition. And I I can always admire that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's also worth noting as well, it's made more impactful, I think, by the fact that Redshift kind of comes almost like between two of the heaviest songs on the record. Yeah, yeah. A Man Exits and Only the Clouds as well. A Man Exits, incidentally, which has like, which is one of my favorite songs here. It has one of the most kind of crushing and brutal 
uh, builds and like uh, progressions as well as some of the lyrics which are some of the darkest and most sort of hopeless and despondent on the entire record I mean he sings about you know joy being pulled from his hands as he's robbed of life and there's this fantastic moment like at the, the final surge of the song where he's screaming about like leaving earth and burning the past and finally being alive it's like you know it's it's the most sort of emotionally over the top sort of mm. melodramatic moment on the entire record but it really feels earned by the time you get to that i mean the whole album like has this sort of feel of like and it's maybe this is somewhat of the space rock influence or maybe this is also just me reading into the album cover and album title as well it sort of feels like bursting out into the atmosphere and kind of trying to escape gravity almost it's like this yeah. very like you know atmospheric and just sort of really like expansive record that makes you feel like you're just so much bigger than everything else or you're so much further away from everything down below oh you. yeah and it, it has oh, yeah. this and real like, sense of like yeah. kinetic movement to it that's just like so intense and i love that about uh, it. yeah and oh absolutely and like it, to just to further complement that feeling of just spaciousness and largeness uh names like redshift the bending and andromeda obviously do a lot to help and evoke this like just galactic sense of scope something that can be said about this record is that i think it really feels like it earns a lot of the imagery it evokes with how like large and spacious it feels where i think there's something to be said about a, a group who who uses like lar this large like stratospheric imagery but then delivers with very underwhelming music Mm. Uh, where this, I feel that is totally earned and like the gravitas and emotional weight of the record really complements how large in ambition and scope they're trying to yeah. uh, deliver on here. When I was listening to it this morning and reading along with the lyrics, I was just trying to like think to myself about, you know, what what does what the album title mean, the satellite years? In a lot of ways, it kind of feels like you know, that one of the prevailing themes of the record as well is kind of being tied either like, you know, tied metaphorically either to your past or to your youth or to your yeah. hometown or whatever and it kind of is like you know the satellite years are those years in which you kind of exist you know stuck within the orbit of something that you're essentially trying to escape and then so it's essentially a record that thematically is about you know growing up essentially and trying to like shed yourself of the shackles of things that you're attached to which is not a new or novel theme for this kind of music but it's one that i think is really powerfully attacked uh one of my favorite songs on the record both musically and lyrically is decoys like curves which yeah, yeah, that's i think one. has some of the most telling lyrics on the record in terms of like communicating this you know very on we laid and feeling there's very striking imagery of sort of driving streets or and just kind of uh being feeling sort of lost within this sort yeah. of nostalgic it, trap oh totally and yeah let's not forget decoys like curves is is just a midwest emo song <laughs> like that da -da 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 fucking riff that is that is just like lifted right out of some like band that's named like i don't know like fourth street boulevard no it's very it's very jimmy eat world with a little bit of like um what's the band yeah. it's a little bit of like get up kids and sort of some of those 90s bands there's also a little bit of sunny day real estate in this as well I yeah think, sunny day real estate kind I of inescapable say. with any emo influence record but i do think that like specifically i'm reminded of that band uh while listening to this like diary era sunny day mm, real estate yeah, while listening yeah. to this as well just in the way that they balance the heaviness and the sort of crushing weight of the sound with the moments of pure beauty that can come through either in the vocals or in other aspects of the instrumentation um i think it's worth talking about what i think is one of the most interesting outliers on the record and, and a song that i think is it's kind of the meeting point of the more sort of fully fleshed out song structures of the longer tracks here and the sort of ambient interludes that being the penultimate song escape pod for intangibles which is again a moment where i think the post-rock element that the band evoke with those instrumental tracks really comes to the fore and is in this point i think infused a little bit more with some of the other influences that the band are going for 
Uh, I read a story that I don't know if it's actually true that Matt Talbot singing on the song was the result of him like losing a bet essentially. And it's a funny thing, like that is you don't necessarily notice that's a different vocal presence the first once or the first few times you listen to the record if you're not like looking out for that. But it does like, especially if you're familiar with Hum as well, like you notice and the power of his voice really lifts up what this song is, which is essentially a single steady post-rock build with a repetitive lyrical refrain that kind of repeats cycles the same verse over and over again as the instrumentation kind of builds around it. It's very explosions in the sky sort of thing. And that's, I think, just a really unique standout moment on the record for me and the way that it veers away from some of the more intense verse, chorus, verse structures and, and crushing metallic heaviness of earlier parts of the record and also sort of sets you up for the utterly sort of mind-melting transcendence of The Bending, which is just one of the best songs. I mean, one of the best metalcore songs ever, really. It's just a, it's a stellar kind of, perfect ending to this record like the the one thing i love one of one of the many things i love about this record is how structurally tight it is and how it kind of continually keeps you invested as it veers from loud to quiet to the middle space in between both within songs and between tracks as well it has a really great ebb flow structure to it that makes it feel i think consistently friendly even as it's you know presumably fairly limited budget you know, makes it sound as though, you know, you can feel that this is not a record that was made with a lot of money. It is a record that has a bit of roughness around the edges, but still that's part of its charm, I think, in the same way that it's the part of the charm. Oh, yeah, like yeah. Thursday, for instance. It's most definitely like uh, it, really the, I guess they're like kind of the, I guess, ragged glory might be a term to describe it. Mm. This just from the dumps making this really outwardly pretty melodic record mm. it's uh, very mineral now that i think about it. another emo band that mm. i've been listening to this year that yeah, i think would yeah. have been very influential on this is mineral which again midwest emo via more sort of progressive influences but very much with a limited budget so you kind of there's roughness to it there's afraidness to it but it's like that's part of the charm and the appeal and you can almost hear in certain parts of this record how this band are kind of like fighting against you know the the limits of how they can make their music sound like there's just moments where yeah sure if this were a band that were more successful or more albums down the line they would have a little bit more money to throw at the sound but I think in a lot of ways the fact that you can feel this band pushing against the edges of what they can do in songs like The Bending for instance is what makes this feel so triumphant in a certain sense because it's again reinforcing and sort of pulling up that theme of of you know being tied down or, or dealing with some kind of adversity that you're pushing and rebelling against and trying to escape from the orbit of point i wanted to address earlier uh what when i mentioned the coheed influence the specific song or not coheed influence but like the shared dna there rather uh, the specific song I wanted to to talk about was uh, Dead in Magazines, which is one of the earlier song, songs that stands out to me as a as just a really significant moment on here. I really love uh, like I know I've spoken before about the guitars on this record, but fuck, the guitars sound so good. I, I just love the the real punchiness uh, the group can bring to them on this record. And that's the thing. This the group definitely has a real mind for merging appeal and like what they want to do, like commercial appeal and what they want to do artistically and stylistically. Mm -hmm. And we've addressed that a bit before with the lower budget, but I think it's, it's pretty evident when you have tracks that do have, that are so guitar driven and you've got tracks that are more vocal driven uh, you have a real diversity on here in terms of structure and composition, at least composition in terms of like what part of the song is leading it. And it, that just, it speaks so much to this group's just like wild creativity. And, and yeah, I think as we've emphasized that so much of the fun of the record, just watching these guys go all out and be all kinds of creative 
with their uh, various sonic palettes on here. Yeah, absolutely. It's just a whirlwind of a record that continually delivers and rewards any yeah. amount of repeated focus. It's- the length of it's perfect also for that. And generally, I think melodic and post-hardcore is good at keeping itself within a, a reasonable to listen to length without getting a bunch of ear fatigue. Yeah, uh, And yeah, th- this record, of course, does that stunningly. It, it makes itself really accessible for just casual and focused re-listens. Absolutely. And I think that that avoidance of ear fatigue as well is something that ties back into the very thoughtful way that even the songs and the albums as well as paced and structured so that you get enough you know, unless you're the kind of listener who's looking for a really punishing experience, in which case you probably won't find this to be your band. But if you are looking for a kind of gateway into the realm of sort of me- of emo adjacent sort of metalcore and screamo sort of styles of music, then you could do a lot worse than tra- treating a record like the Satellite Years as an entry point, because I think that it offers so yeah. much that the that casual listeners can latch onto without being too kind of alienating as an experience either it's it's yeah re, it's a really be, well balanced album and and it's nice to get to talk about something I, I think there's definitely value to records that kind of go full hog on whatever that they are even if, if that you know results in something that maybe isn't as cohesive or tightly structured as it could be but still kind of just has that pure passion for a sound that yeah. you know the best records yeah. have but there is also something to be said for a record like the satellite years which is you know it almost feels weird to describe it in this way considering the genres and influences and styles but it's almost tasteful in a certain sense yeah is- like and that's so bizarre about it that it's like the tasteful version of this sound and I guess my inclusion in this episode and me picking this should speak a lot to that because generally I don't find myself getting on board with a a ton of metalcore, maybe the select thing here or there, but Mm. uh, like this is so good at just appealing to so many sensibilities and ideas that yeah, uh, tasteful is such a weirdly perfect word to describe it yeah yeah it's like tasteful but also again that sort of somewhat lo-fi sort of diy sound to it as well also makes it feel sort of like really appealing like in the same way that early jimmy Eat world is to me as well where it's like i I guess like tasteful with an asterisk might even be a better yeah like it like also the fact that you can tell that these are really seasoned musicians like the the ways in which they switch from different sort of styles of music or from heavier moments to softer moments is always really really well polished and well done like there, there's never any kind of roughness around the edges or any kind of bum notes or any kind of like signs of fatigue in any way they're just a really accomplished band who've clearly been playing together or in other bands for a really long time and honed what they want to do so whereas a lot of other records that have this kind of appeal from very diy emo artists again records like mineral and early jimmy world and stuff you know you can hear the raggedness you can hear the kind of like lack of professionalism or maybe somewhat of a lack of experience and that's part of the appeal but it's also just an attribute that it has Whereas here it's like, you can tell that there is a lot of finesse in this construction of these songs. And it's just, you know, it's it's basically an impeccable album, if not a perfect one. It's just really, really, really great stuff. And it deserves to be celebrated on its 20th anniversary for being a classic, really, because it doesn't really get its due in that regard. It may just be that their most recent album cover looks very similar to the most recent album cover for the most recent La Dispute album but I thought of La Dispute a lot while listening to this band as well they're another band they don't so much have the beauty aspect but they definitely have the heaviness and the thematic density that this band have as well as the professionalism and the refinement as well so if you're a fan of La Dispute if you're a fan of say Touche Amore if you're a fan of any of the other reference points that we've brought up in this episode as well I would say this is this should be considered essential listening or if you're again as i said if you're somehow at this point in the video and you're not fairly familiar yeah. with much of this music at all then this would be a great entry point i mean fuck i i feel we should add like morgan on here just to list off some like fucking metalcore bands who have a mm. similar appeal to this 
Yeah, I, uh, Morgan did from listen this to time. this, and he was a big fan of this as well. Um, and of course, this is a ten out of ten Connor Core album as well. So I feel bad almost that we couldn't have him. But anyway, yeah. um, let's do our favorite tracks and ratings for Hopes they Force the Satellite Years. Yeah, August, why don't you go first? Yeah, for sure. Uh, my favorites on here. I I mean, it's a tough pick just because it is such a like cohesive singular experience of a record. Uh, but I'd, I'd have to go with like Dead in Magazines, Decoys Like Curves, and The Bending. Least favorite on here, I, I might say A Man Exits, which isn't necessarily a song I hate, but I think I think that's a moment where the band gets sounds a little less distinct and a little more just lost solely in the heavy abrasiveness, uh, in my opinion. But I mean... I love this record. It's uh it's a fucking eight out of ten. Hell yes. All right. Uh Jake, who couldn't join us and probably also wouldn't have wanted to join us, is not a huge fan of this record, but he does get the appeal. He gives it a six. Uh Morgan hasn't rated it yet, but he said he really likes it a lot. So, so he's, probably, I, he's probably gonna give it an eight or something. I, I would guess between like an eight or a nine. It it's I'm really just, a I'm yeah. just going to put in an eight for him and he can correct it because I don't he think can he... correct it if he wants. Yeah. Uh, and for, as for me, yes. Uh, what are your favorite tracks and rating? My three favorite tracks are uh, the bending decoys, like curves and dead in magazines. My least favorite track is probably only the clouds, but I still think that's very good. Uh, and I'm going to give this album a nine out of 10, a very light, but still emphatic nine out of 10. I think that this is a genre classic and it is so in the wheelhouse of so many things that I love that it's very difficult for me to fault it in any significant way, which gives us an average overall of 7.8 for Hopes Falls, The Satellite Years. Let us know at home what you think of this record, if you've heard it, what you think of Hopes For, what you think of their other records as well. Are there any that we should check out? Any underrated gems? What are your favorite metalcore, hardcore, emo records in general? Let us know space, in the comments I below. mean, space rock, if you like it. Fuck it. Yeah, yeah, I actually would love to get some good space rock wrecks. I feel like I haven't yes. listened to much of that lately. Space so, rock, dick cock, anything you can throw at us. Space me up. Um, yes, let me know in the comments below. Uh, as always, if you enjoyed the episode, please consider giving it a like and subscribing. If you have not already, both those things help us out tremendously. If you want to go above and beyond and support us and become a member of the Jams and Tea family, you can hit the join button for just $1 a month and get your name credited in the title crawl of every video on this channel. Plus, if you want to recommend us some music to talk about, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. August is only left to you to take us home. Oh, shit. As always, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago. Gideon Bibles to win men, women, and young people for the Lord Jesus Christ.